A federal judge in Washington is expected to rule by tomorrow on the tribe's request for an injunction. But Scott, these demonstrators tell us win or lose, they won't leave. President Obama has been briefed on the Florida cases. White House officials are criticizing Congress for leaving for recess before striking a Zika funding deal. You know to hold on to the seatbelt even though you're not wearing it. Yeah, that's the only way to stay still. So The only way to stay safe? Yeah. When you put your hands on it and you think of the history down here. I know. It's a little spooky. It is. You're touching it. You're touching history. There are those who would say that this aircraft does not need to be replaced, that the taxpayers simply can't afford to buy a new presidential plane. I write the fact checker column for the Washington Post. So you catch politicians when they lie and call them out on it. That's right. And how's business these days? It's better than ever. Even though all of the demonstrations today have been peaceful, the governor has now authorized the highest number of National Guard troop deployments yet, 3,000 now. You're spending about 200 million on this device. That's a lot of money, especially for an organization that lost $5 billion last year, that wants the option to cut Saturday delivery. Can you afford it? You've got a master's in higher ed, and you want to get into a dying business? Yeah. Uh, Why? I don't know. Self is in my blood. Law enforcement helicopters flew in and out of Dannemora today to give pilots a chance to get familiarized with this heavily wooded area. She described that meeting to us as simply amazing. Jackie Kennedy oversaw the design of that blue and white scheme, and before that, really, the presidential planes had been more military. Did a poll of the most anticipated fair attraction this year. Politicians' speeches came in fourth, right after the livestock and a cow made of butter. Benita. <laughs> The leader of the company behind the controversial Dakota Access oil pipeline believes President-elect Donald Trump will help get the project finished. Protesters from more than 200 Native American tribes have been camped out near the site since August. The pipeline stretches from oil fields in North Dakota to Illinois. There are concerns about potential environmental damage. Mark Albert is outside Energy Transfer Partners headquarters in Dallas. He spoke to CEO Kelsey Warren in an interview you will only see here on CBS This Morning. Mark, good morning to you. Good morning. The CEO is breaking his silence as he faces mounting threats and lengthening delays. He still remains bullish on the post-election future of his pipeline, which is now 84 percent complete. But the final 1,000 feet or so are being temporarily stopped by the Obama administration. We will get this easement and we will complete our project. Energy Transfer Partners CEO Kelsey Warren is confident a Donald Trump presidency means his company's controversial Dakota Access Pipeline will be completed. Once he takes over January 20th, what are the prospects? Oh, it's 100 percent. 100 percent that the easement gets granted and, and, and the pipeline gets built. The president-elect has minor holdings in Warren's company, and Warren donated $103,000 to Trump's campaign. Have you spoken to Donald Trump about the pipeline? I, I've never met the man. You've never met him? No. But he's invested in you, and you're invested in him. <laughs> well, I wish him well. Thousands of demonstrators in North Dakota have been camped out near several pipeline construction sites, which at times have turned violent and led to over 400 arrests. Native Americans and environmentalists say the pipeline could threaten the water supply of millions and disrespects sacred lands. Warren told us it will make oil cheaper to transport and create jobs. It doesn't help the United States if it leaks, right? It doesn't help the people who live downstream. I'm not going to win that argument with you because pipelines do leak. It's rare. I think the chances of this pipeline leaking is extremely remote. The company says it is taking every precaution to make the steel pipeline safe, and its employees are facing death threats. Our people have been under attack. I hope your parents, your children especially, all burn in hell. When finished, the pipeline will be more than 1,100 miles long. That's just seven miles shorter than the controversial Keystone XL pipeline, which President Obama rejected in 2015. Trump has yet to speak about the Dakota Access Pipeline, but said this about Keystone last month. We're going to allow the Keystone Pipeline and so many other things to move forward. You think all the protesters are going to go away once you're done? Absolutely. What is there to protest? They are determined to stop your project. They will not stop our project. That's naive. You're, they're not stopping our project. Trump's team did not respond to our request for comment. Warren told us the company wants to reimburse the state of North Dakota and Morton County for the millions spent so far on protests and security. 
but that authorities have not yet accepted his offer. Nora. All right, Mark, great interview. Great get to hear that perspective. Thank you so much. Lighthouses are a storied part of American history. They've not only lit the path for ships and boats, but guided the way for the country's founding. This Wednesday marks the 300th birthday of America's first lighthouse, now a National Historic Landmark. Mark Albert takes us ashore. Jetting off into Boston Harbor aboard a Coast Guard boat, we follow the currents of history, navigating to a beacon older than the Republic. When we dock on Little Brewster Island, we're greeted by a woman dressed like it's 1783. She's Sally Snowman, the last Coast Guard lighthouse keeper in America. What's it like living on an island with a lighthouse? Uh, <laughs> a dream come true. Boston Lighthouse has been both a dream and a vision for countless mariners through the centuries. Three centuries, in fact. So people have been walking up this way to the base of the lighthouse for 300 years? Absolutely. And Snowman's job is to safeguard it for the next 300. She makes rounds twice a day and took us along on a cloudy Thursday in July, starting at the lighthouse's imposing granite base that's seven and a half feet thick. You're going to be touching part of the original 1716 foundation. Right now. Right now, you're touching it. Built 60 years before the American Revolution, Boston Lighthouse has weathered countless storms, some man-made. The American rebels set it on fire twice to stop it from guiding occupying British forces. George Washington himself gave the order the second time. Then the Redcoats, in their retreat from Boston in 1776, blew up the lighthouse. The victorious Americans finally rebuilt it in 1783. It's been raised in stages through the centuries, now towering over Boston Harbor at 89 feet tall, almost nine stories. 76 spiral stairs and two ladders. As the conical walls get narrower, we reach the first ladder. Okay, come on up. We are in the gear room. This is what makes the light turn. Exactly. It rotates 4,000 pounds of glass and brass. And when we look up inside, we see a short little bulb or lamp that's 1,000 watts. It's tiny. It's tiny, and it gets magnified to 2 million candle power. By all the glass. By all the glass. Another ladder takes us to the crystal orb that saved countless lives, 336 prisms in a 13-foot-tall Fresnel lens. Unusual for a lighthouse, it rotates counterclockwise, a light that cuts through the darkness every 10 seconds, visible at least 27 nautical miles away. The light gets reflected and refracted and into a narrow beam into the bullseyes, and that's what we see flashing. Wow, this is breathtaking. Oh my gosh, and there's downtown Boston. Absolutely, and imagine on the 3rd and 4th of July, fireworks everywhere, up and down the North Shore, the South Shore, panoramic views. You've got the best view in Boston. Absolutely. Snowman has been a keeper for 13 years and oversees a team of 90 volunteers. She took us to her favorite spot on the island, a windy perch few get to experience. When you sit up here, do you think of your predecessors hundreds of years ago, sitting and taking in this view? Absolutely. I mean, I've been up here at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's just been awesome. It's a magical place. Even when it's foggy, it feels like you're cloaked, that nothing can happen to you, that you're safe. The lighthouse is one of 371 operated by the U.S. Coast Guard. They're volunteers, about 1,000. Claudia Gelzer is the captain of the port in Boston. Why in the world does a 21st century Coast Guard need a three-century-old lighthouse. She has been serving really the same purpose for 300 years and keeping mariners out of trouble, out of shoal waters, and, and guiding them safely into Boston Harbor. Mariners wanted to go to ports that had lighthouses because it was safer for them to navigate in and out. Eric J. Dolan is the author of the recent book, Brilliant Beacons, A History of the American Lighthouse. He says Boston Lighthouse allowed its young city to thrive and expand, and lighthouses all along the East Coast reeled in commerce for a newborn nation. We would not be the country we are today without the service that lighthouses and their dependable keepers have provided. In your book, you call them beacons, 
and sentinels. Yeah, it's these towering uh, symbols of welcome and safety. But in an age of GPS, radar, and sonar, many wonder if these symbols of another era should drift into history. Why not just tear down some of these lighthouses? Some lighthouses have been torn down, but many lighthouses are so integrally entwined with the history and the identity of the communities where they are located that if you try to tear down a lighthouse, you are going to have a political uprising. Just ask Congress. While the Coast Guard has automated all of its lighthouses, lawmakers decreed in 1989 that Boston Lighthouse, the nation's first, be forever manned as a tribute. Which is why Sally Snowman is the latest in a long line of keepers to live on Little Brewster Island, kept company by her husband Jay. In 300 years, how many keepers have there been? I'm the 70th, and the first 69 were all men. You're the first woman keeper? Out here at Boston Light. Still making history after three centuries. Absolutely, and we're going to keep on making it. Inside her front door is a sign that reads, we'll leave the light on for you. At Boston Lighthouse, that isn't just a saying. It's an unblinking promise kept for centuries. For CBS This Morning Saturday, Mark Albert in Boston Harbor. To celebrate the tricentennial, there'll be a ceremony on the island on Wednesday, September 14th, the lighthouse's official birthday. Tours are available weekly through the National Park Service. That was President-elect Barack Obama's first trip on one of the Boeing 747s that become Air Force One when the commander-in-chief is aboard. The current planes are getting old and the Pentagon wants to buy new ones. The Air Force gave us an extraordinary behind-the-scenes access to learn how that may come about. And Mark Albert is here with a story you'll only see on CBS This Morning Saturday. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. For the first time, the military may buy three 747s to replace the current two. Air Force One is the most recognizable aircraft in the world. Six stories tall, two-thirds of a football field long, and carrying immeasurable prestige. More than hail to the chief, more than the ubiquitous Secret Service agents, even more than the famous SEAL. There is no more identifiable symbol of the mobile presidency than Air Force One. It has come to represent the, uh, the power of the American presidency, the reach of the American presidency, and it's come to symbolize American technology and America's technological prowess. Ken Walsh wrote a book on Air Force One and has covered the past five presidents for U.S. News and World Report. He's flown on Air Force One about 300 times. What is it like to fly on a presidential aircraft? For a president, it's fabulous. When they left office, the four who've left office say the thing they miss the most is Air Force One. But under their polished exterior, the two aircraft that commonly serve as Air Force One are aging, now a quarter century old. Even though both Boeing 747-200s have only flown a fraction as much as a commercial 747 of the same age, the Air Force says it's time for a new generation of presidential wings. We've got a, a pretty good-sized team working on it. We Colonel Amy McCain is in charge of ordering the new Air Force One and gave CBS This Morning Saturday her first television interview. Why does the president need a new Air Force One? It's the only 747-200 left in the United States that is flying. So it costs us a lot more time and money to keep that airplane flying than it used to. So it's actually uh, cheaper in the long run to replace it. McCain's team has grown from 20 people to 80 in just the past year and will soon expand to 100. In January, the Air Force announced its intention to use Boeing's 747-8 airframe. The long-range, wide-body aircraft is made in Everett, Washington, and comes with a longer fuselage, greater wingspan, and new engines and avionics. It will be heavily modified with all the latest technological and security gear. But this symbol of America doesn't come cheap. Updated budget documents provided to CBS News by the Air Force show its request to Congress starts with $102 million this year, and the numbers quickly gain altitude, more than $3 billion in total in the next five years. And that's not counting the final three years of the project. There are those who would say that this aircraft does not need to be replaced, that the taxpayers simply can't afford 
to buy a new presidential plane. The top priority is if an affordable aircraft that will meet the presidential requirements. How many planes are you buying? We're buying up to three. What is the idea behind buying three instead of two? It depends upon all the availability of having uh, two airplanes available for the president at any one time. If the deal takes off, the current Air Force One will likely land here, the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, home to nine presidential aircraft. We're going to complete our fourth building pretty soon. We'll the museum's historian, aircraft. Jeff Underwood, says the history of presidential aircraft is filled with triumph and turbulence. Franklin Roosevelt was the first to fly while in office. This is the aircraft that carried Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Yalta in 1945. It has an elevator, an electric-powered elevator. The four-engine Douglas plane, codenamed the Sacred Cow, was modified for the president, who was stricken by polio at age 39. Roosevelt flew on the plane only once before his death. Harry Truman then used it, signing the act that created the Air Force at this onboard table. And this would have been President Nixon's view. This has been President Nixon's view. This process. is the Boeing 707 Obviously. that took the first American president to China and carried eight presidents over 36 years. And if these walls could talk, uh, the stories they could tell. Jackie Kennedy approved the now iconic blue and white design still in use today. This 707 also flew the Kennedys to Dallas and President Kennedy's successor back to Washington. The original logbook from that date kept here shows the one flight with two presidents after Lyndon Johnson took the oath of office in a packed, sweltering cabin. This is where the tide of American history changes is this very spot. Right where we're standing. Right where we're standing. The headwinds of history buffeted George W. Bush aboard Air Force One on 9-11 as the plane became an airborne refuge after the terror attacks. In 70 years of presidential flight, Underwood says the unique set of aircraft we now know as Air Force One has taken the country to new heights. This is not just the president's plane. This is the plane that belongs to the people of the United States. When you look on the side of the airplane, it tells you United States of America. This is a symbol of the United States and we are the people of the United States. The Air Force hopes to sign the first contract with Boeing later this year for the next Air Force One. The goal is to have the new 747s flying the president eight years from now in 2023. That was such a fascinating story, but you always hear that there's these unwritten rules. Did you find out, are there any when it comes to Air Force One? We, we did hear that there are two major unwritten rules when it comes to buying a new Air Force One. First, it has to be in a president's second term. So uh, President Reagan, President Obama, that guarantees that that current president Politics well, it's not politics yeah. involved. They will not be flying on the plane. As you saw, it's going to take about eight years, so President Obama will be out of office. The second unwritten rule is that you have to buy American. And so Boeing is an American company. It's the only American company that has the four-engine, wide-body, a plane that the Air Force wants, and so Boeing will probably get the contract. That's pretty cool. I also, so who designed the exterior of the plane, the paint job? What was so neat is that Jackie Kennedy oversaw the design of that blue and white scheme. And before that, really, the presidential planes had been more military. But then she put China on board, the artwork, and the iconic Pretty paint cool. scheme. Great story, Mark Albert. Thank you so much.